Good morning. What a joy it is for us to be tuned in together. I'm glad that you've joined us this morning for this time of, of worship. I send greetings to you from the part of the family that worshiped at 9 o'clock here uh, at the church, uh, that we are connected by the Spirit, and we are all family. So it is good for us to have that connection this morning. As we begin this morning, I want us to lift up prayers throughout the, the service and during our prayer time uh, to remember the anniversary of 9-11. It was on Friday, and, and we continue to, to pray for those that lost their lives, for those that were on the front lines, all first responders, uh, all people that were affected. That was the whole country. And I ask that we lift up prayers that we can find that sense of unity and peace again together uh, as we did during that time, that we can continue to move forward as God's children. So let us remember those people and let us lift them up in prayer. As we begin our service, I invite you to greet those that are in your household and around you. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning back there. And let us stand and, and uh, wherever you are and sing. The words will come on the screen. Oh, how I love Jesus. I invite you to join in the call to worship. The words are on your screen. Sing songs of hope and peace. God's, God's love, love and, and power, power have lifted, lifted us. us. Sing songs of mercy and grace. God's, God's mercy, mercy and, and forgiveness, forgiveness frame, frame our lives. Thanks be to God for all God's love and mercy. Praise, Praise be to God, God for the healing power God, God extends, extends to each one of us. Amen. Amen. I uh, invite the children, wherever they are in the household, to gather around the closest uh, screen that has the service on it, uh, that uh, I might have a few words with them, and everyone else can listen in as, as well. What's the hardest two words it is for you, for you to say? What are the hardest two words for you to say? Think about that for a moment. And I don't mean pronouncing words, uh, but what are the hardest words because of what it means to say those words? Do you have those two words? See if these are the two words. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Those are the hardest two words, I think, to say. When somebody that you like or care about, or even somebody you don't know, and you did something to, to them, and to say, I'm sorry for doing that. Well, think about if somebody did that to you. Are you able then to do another thing that's really, really hard, and that's to forgive them? If they did something that hurt you, if they called you a name, 
But then they come back and they say, I'm sorry. Are you able to say that they're forgiven, that you forgive them? That's a hard thing to do, and that's something that Jesus asks us to do, is to, to forgive one another. You know, God forgives us. When we do something that would hurt God, and that means we maybe hurt somebody we care about or somebody that we don't know but didn't do anything to us, and, and we just called them a name or we played a trick on them, if they say they're sorry, are we able to forgive them? I want you to think about that. I want you to talk to your moms and your dads and your grandparents and, and maybe even you and your siblings can talk about it, your brothers and sisters, because that's something we should always be thinking about. How can we say, I'm sorry, but then when somebody hurts us, are we able to forgive them? Because that's what Jesus asked us to do. I want you to have a great week. I know I've heard from from many uh, young people like you that are having kind of a difficult time with the school on, online. And I'm praying uh, that you'll be able to go back to classes as soon as possible. If we continue to wear our mask and we continue to be safe distance and wash our hands, then maybe that time will come soon. So I am praying for you and I hope that you have a, a great week and I hope it's a cooler week. Take care. Bye-bye. I want to uh, share with you that there really uh, uh, isn't much in the way of opportunities or invitations. Uh, there'll be some, an invitation for you during our offering for the golden basket. Uh, but uh, there, uh, just a reminder, if you are willing to volunteer uh, in some way, uh, if you've come to the outdoor service or, or look to and you want to be part of that team, uh, and you're able to and you feel safe enough, only if you feel safe and comfortable, uh, we invite you to do that. Uh, if you want to be part of our uh, Sunday morning audio-visual team, uh, you can let us know and we'll continue to, to work at training uh, folks and uh, bring you on board with, with that as, as well. Um, and I want to just continue as a way of an invitation. Uh, my vlog this last week, I invited people to think about smiles a gift from God and a gift that we can have, and even with our mask on, that we can continue to smile in a way of showing appreciations to others. So that's, uh, that's my invitation for you for this week. Keep on smiling. This morning we have uh, two quilts uh, that are here for us to bless the uh, first one is a friend of Lana Sawyer, Joe Dyer. Uh, he is uh, recovering uh, from uh, f um, prostate from cancer, so we want to continue to lift up uh, healing for, for him. The other is for Mary Cotman, our, our retired administrative assistant. Her, her sister J Jane had a, uh, a very horrific fall. She's on the men, but she has a long way to go. So we want to lift up uh, Jane in our prayers and for all the family. So for, for uh, Jane and for Joe, we want to offer a blessing for these quilts. Let us pray. Most gracious and loving God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for your spirit that surrounds Jane and Joe, that you continue to bring healing to them to give them strength as they move forward. We give you thanks, O oh God, that we can be connected and part of that healing process by lifting up these gifts and by reaching out through our love and our embrace with them. So, loving God, we ask your blessing upon these gifts and, and for Joe and Jane as they receive them, that they might know that you continue to surround them and that we, this church family, touches their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First candle I light this morning again is for all those that have been affected and you might want to say that it's been almost every one of us by the COVID-19. Uh, either somebody we know or somebody that we know is 
on the front lines as a medical staff person, doctor, nurses, other first responders. So we lift up this candle that we again pray to God that um, a way to subside and to bring healing and um, an end to this uh, virus. The second candle we light for all of those that are doing battle with the fires that are all around us and for all the families and communities that have been affected, the homes that have been lost, the lives that have been lost. We pray for those families that are grieving and, and still searching for loved ones. And we pray and continue to pray for cooler weather and, and better conditions uh, for these frontline uh, fighters of these fires. Also lift up uh, this candle for Adam Hawthorne's uh, father, John, who is facing surgery tomorrow uh, in Connecticut. So we lift up uh, prayers for John Hawthorne and pray for his healing. We light this candle for Ken Boyle. Ken, one of our, our uh, family members here at the church whose health continues to deteriorate and and that God will bring peace to him and comfort uh, to these days. And also for Jesse, that she might be comforted and strength to, to hold her. And also Peter, their grandson, and the rest of the family. We lift up prayers for them. And these prayers uh, that are on our prayer list for uh, who I call the Larrys, Larry Murphy and, and Larry Natwood, continue prayers in their uh, healing and, and comfort in this uh, time as they um, continue to do battle with their health issues. Let us hold these persons, those that are on our screen and those in our hearts and, and minds in our prayers as we go to God. Let us pray. Of loving God, how you love us so much, demonstrated through your Son, Jesus Christ. And in our faith, O oh God, as we express ourselves in praises to you, how we love you and love your Son, Jesus Christ, that spirit that fills us and lifts us. We continue to struggle on, O oh God, as, as we deal with the effects of COVID-19, the real effects of the, the health issues that continue to, to cause concern, grave concern for us in our communities. We pray for wise decisions by our leaders and by those in the community to care for one another, to do no harm, and that we can help in bringing about suppression to this virus to such a time that we can bring it to a close. Holy God, we pray for your children around the world, for the hungry, the homeless, for the marginalized who have no voice to speak out, that we can be that voice for justice and inclusiveness, for welcome and equality. We pray, Holy God, for those that we have lifted up on our prayer list, in our hearts and minds, for healing, for care, for strength, for those that are coming to the close of their life here on earth, but preparing to enter eternal life with you through your Son, Jesus Christ, as you prepare to welcome them to their eternal home. We pray, O oh God, for those that are facing surgeries and, and long recovery periods from illnesses or injuries. We pray for your healing strength and for those that can provide support and encouragement. We give you thanks, O oh God, for this day to be celebrated. To be celebrated because of a kind smile that was shared with us, a, a word of kindness and encouragement, a 
a word of hope that has lifted our spirits. We, we thank you for the beauty of your world. We thank you for those that have said, here I am, Lord. Use me in whatever way you can. Those that are fighting fires, those that are trying to save homes, save communities. Pray for those, oh God, that have lost homes. And we pray for those that are willing to go when the time comes to rebuild and to bring comfort. Holy God, do we pray as we walk on in our faith that we can love one another as you have loved us. And so we ask and pray all these things in the name of your Son, that perfect example of love. As we share a prayer so deep to you that has been taught to us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
scripture passage comes to us this morning from Matthew, once again, the uh, chapter 18, uh, verses 21 through 35. It is a continuation of our uh, reading and uh, understanding of sin within the church. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times, Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, and as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of the servant released him and forgave him his debt. But that same servant, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay me what you owe. And the servant fell down on his knees and pleaded with him, Have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he could pay the debt. When the fellow servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to the Lord all that had taken place. Then the Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all your debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have done, had mercy on your fellow servant as I have had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. May God add understanding to our hearing of the word this morning. Amen. A group of uh, Americans were on a short-term mission trip to the city of La Entrada in Honduras. They joined with several Hondurans to, to go and visit some of the poorest of the poor families in Honduras. And as they sat in the homes of these parents of school-age children to hear their stories and to hear how they could not afford the school supplies for their children to, to use and trying to figure out how they could offer support. One of those that, uh, that was local that was there to help them, a man by the name of, of Kelvin, who was their translator that taught at a bilingual school there in Honduras. He was a key member to the team because of his gifts. After just a few days, he, he turned to them and said, I can no longer be of help and, and serve on this team, I have to leave. This created a, a huge problem with this team, and, and they, they asked him why, and he shared it was because one of the fellow Hondurans had done wrong, had injured him, had hurt him. One of the Americans tried to mediate the conflict in English, and, and one of the Hondurans tried to to mediate in Spanish to no avail. Finally, though, Kelvin said that he would be willing to, to work with the team, and he said, I am a Christian. He, I must forgive. What a simple and yet profound thought. I am a Christian. I must forgive. But for everyone who follows Jesus, this is easier said than done. I believe it's, if not the, the hardest thing, one of the hardest things to do as a Christian. What we learn from the Gospel of Matthew is that forgiveness begins as a choice and then becomes a process. Something to become ingrained within us. That it becomes second nature in living out our faith. First we choose to forgive, then we follow through with it again and again. And again, Jesus urges us to make the choice to forgive when 
he responds to, to Peter, to Peter's question. You, you just heard it as, as I, I read it. How many times should we forgive? That was Peter's question. If another member sins against me, should I forgive one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times? And Jesus answers, no, not seven times, but 77 times. Other translations say 70 times seven, 490 times. However you count it, Jesus is saying that your forgiveness should be countless. It should go on and on and on. He's like a personal trainer at, at a gym, urging you to increase your, your reputations, trying to help you get, get stronger every day, helping you to count out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seventy-seven, four hundred and ninety. But Jesus is not a personal trainer. He is a forgiveness trainer. Forgiveness is a limitless number of times, Jesus is telling us. Make the choice to do it, and then turn it into an ongoing process. Let it be ingrained within your faith. Jesus knows that we get stronger through forgiveness reps. So why exactly does Jesus say this? Forgiving can be hard to do, much tougher than if you went to a gym and, and tried to, to lift some weights. But Jesus recommends it, be, it because he knows that forgiveness is good for us. Forgiveness can enable us to regain the, the personal power that we've lost when someone sins uh, against us. Always forgive your enemies, said the writer Oscar Wilde. Nothing annoys them so much. Or Paul writes in 1 Corinthians Love your enemies. It's like heaping coals upon their head. But Jesus isn't telling us to forgive to, so that we can annoy someone else or that it's like heaping coals upon their head. No, Jesus tells us to forgive to bring about healing. Unfortunately, many people fail to forgive. Jesus tells the story as I just recounted uh, of a servant who owned his ma owed his master millions of dollars, several millions of, of dollars in today's dollars. Since a single talent was worth more than 15 years of, of wages for a laborer, the amount here is the millions of today's dollars. And, and what servant would have that kind of, of cash? And so he comes before his master, and, and when the master then wants to sell, he and his wife and the possessions, to at least recoup some of his losses, this person falls on his knees and begs for mercy. And the master is moved and forgives him his debt. Imagine that, forgives him several millions of dollars of debt, Think of the largest debt that you might have. Maybe it's a car loan. Maybe it's a, a house loan. Maybe it's some other type of debt that you have. The largest one you had and somebody calls you up and tells you that it's forgiven. What a weight off of your shoulders. How your spirits would be lifted. And then the same servant, as the story goes on to tell us, you'd think that would be the, the end of it to live happily ever after. But instead, he goes, finds a, another servant who owes him, relatively speaking, a few bucks compared to what was just forgiven him, grabs him by the throat and shakes him. and says, give me what you owe. And the, the servant doesn't have it. Falls on his knees and, and he begs for mercy, give me a little bit more time. The servant doesn't do it. He, he orders him to be thrown into prison at such a time that he can repay it. Now, this is the part of the story that I have trouble with, is, is how can someone, when they're in prison, repay some money that he owes or she owes to, to, to someone else? That doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand debtor's prison, and some of you may understand it more than I and can explain it at a later time. Well, then the friends of the, of the servant that went to, to prison were very upset, as you can imagine, and they went back to the owner. 
And they said, this is what this servant that you forgave did. And so the owner calls in the servant into his office. Dun, dun, dun. You can hear that music, right? He comes into the office and he said, I forgave you your debt. Should you not have shown the same mercy to your fellow servant as I have shown mercy to you? And of course the answer is, is yes. Yes, he should have shown mercy, but he did not. He did not see forgiveness as an ongoing process, one that began with his master and should have continued with him. The master hands him over to be tortured, and so God will do to every one of you, promises Jesus, if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. That's the key to the end of the passage. Forgive your brother and sister from your heart. That doesn't mean the one that has sinned gets off the hook. doesn't mean there isn't accountability. Our forgiveness trainer, Jesus, is tougher than, than any coach of any gym standing over us and barking, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Jesus demands that we forgive other people based on the fact that we have all been forgiven. Forgiveness is a process that begins with God, continues with us, and makes us stronger every day. That's what Kelvin in Honduras came to understand and what we should all grasp as well. The amazing thing about forgiveness is that it's not just good for our Christian faith, it's also good for our health. A psychologist named Robert Enright has found ways to include forgiveness in his therapy sessions and, and a study to, to shows the benefits. According to Salon magazine, Enright is helping elderly women to forgive people who have wronged them in the past. Some of them are victims of, of abuse and rape and incest. He's created two groups. One group of, of women has within it uh, the learnings of how forgiveness should be a part of their lives. And another group where they receive therapy, but forgiveness focus is not a part of it. So what do you think he found out? The forgiveness therapy group has, has shown greater improvement in emotional and, and psychological health than the group that did not focus on forgiveness. Forgiveness helps people to heal themselves and regain their personal power. A number of years ago, when I was an associate pastor at a, at a former church, we brought in a, a learned scholar on restorative justice and a practitioner as well in restorative justice. He worked with victims of violent crimes, whether it was uh, they themselves that were injured or a family member who was either injured or killed in, in the commission of a crime, and helping them to come face to face with the perpetrator. And it was just as much about them as it was about forgiving the one who committed the crime, the injury. It was about their own healing, their own well-being. How differently the parable would have ended if the servant had realized that he was more a, 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 both a debtor as well as a person who owed money, a sinner and a person who had been sinned against. If he had done so, he would not have seen himself as an isolated victim. Forgiveness training would have helped him to, to see himself clearly let go of the pain and the blame and, and find a way to forgive the, the fellow servant who owed him a few dollars. Jesus urges us, forgive your brother and sister from your heart. Forgiveness is good for us, says Dr. Frederick Luskin, because it con counteracts the, the, the stress that makes us feel like helpless victims. When you forgive, he says, you, you wipe all that clean. Forgiveness does not mean that the offender, what the offender did was right. But it does mean that the victim is moving beyond that past. Forgiveness is both a choice and a process. 
Recall what took place in 2006, 14 years ago. This incident moved me so much. It occurred in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, when a group of Amish men and women, women took a stand for forgiveness after a gunman went into an Amish schoolhouse and slaughtered five young girls. Most impressive was the way that this peace loving Christian community reached out to support the gunman's widow and their children. Such an exemplary acts of witness stir the imagination of the larger world, said L. Gregory Jones of Duke Divinity School. We need our imagination to be set on fire by stories that show what, what we think is possible or unrealistic is indeed possible. The Amish were able to forgive fully because they had spent their entire lives in in a spiritual tradition that included forgiveness rents. The process went on. It was ingrained in their faith living. Jesus wants us to get stronger and healthier by making the decision to forgive. He then challenges us to, to turn that choice into this ongoing process based on the willingness to to forgive others because we have been forgiven by God. Jesus acts as our trainer, challenging us to do forgiveness rests until the practice becomes part of who we are, ingrained with us. But Jesus is more than that. He is our mentor. He walks uh, uh, alongside us because we will slip back. We will struggle with this as i said forgiving is one of the hardest things to do in our christian faith but jesus will always be there to give us the ability to empower us to forgive he'll be our cheerleader one of the known physical trainers that I have had a a number of tapes uh, of his in the past, and now you can see him on on commercials, infomercials, but also on uh, uh, commercials for one of the uh, uh, cell companies, Tony Little. And Tony says, as he goes through the exercise, you can do it. That's what Jesus will tell us. You can do it. You can forgive. We can wipe the slate clean by forgiving our brothers and, and sisters. That's a choice that lowers our stress and increases our personal power. It also heals us and the people around us. May God help us in this process. Amen. We are blessed every day. If we're truly open to God's presence in our lives. We can see a blessing every day, a gift that is given to us, a forgiveness that has occurred. We are invited to give, to be generous, to support the ministries and the mission of of this church, but in a broader sense, God's church. This week, the golden offering, again, if you are sending in a, a check, you can write golden basket on it will go to support our missionary. It's a new missionary, Clara Marudula Biswas. She's from Bangladesh. And and what impressed me the most, as as Sally was sharing uh, with me about her, is that she's from Bangladesh. She's from one of the poorest countries of the world. And she goes to serve some of the poorest in Cambodia, the children of the street. If you're so moved to offer a second gift to support her ministry, we invite you to do that. If you're giving online, there is a place to click for Golden Basket, and for the next week, those gifts that come in will go towards supporting our missionary, Clara. Let us reflect on the gifts that have been given to us as we listen as Corey shares a gift with us.
Before I lift up the prayer, another gift and thanks I, I want to share. I, I saw a couple comments on Facebook about our, our curtains in the back. I want to thank Marlene Oaks uh, for taking the initiative uh, and uh, being done with the faded black uh, paper that was up there and to do these curtains. So I want to thank Marlene and, and I've heard and already read some positive comments about that. So it is a blessed gift for us and and our worship uh, setting here. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for the gifts that have been shared, for the love that can be offered because of these gifts, O oh God, here in our community and around the world. We ask uh, all this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Let us stand where you are and let us sing our closing song, Help Us Accept Each Other. Go now and may the God of love and grace, the God of forgiveness, and may the Son, Jesus Christ, who encourages us in that process of forgiveness, and the Holy Spirit that gives us the strength to live out that forgiveness, be with you this day and always. Amen. Amen.